Okay, so we're beginning a, a new sermon series today, and it is inspired by a, a particular genre of pop culture entertainment. Uh, we're calling it the Bible on Broadway for the rest of the month of July. We'll be talking about some of the most popular musicals in Broadway history. Uh, and before we get started, we need to, to set the stage just a bit because musicals are not necessarily everyone's thing. Now, I'm not sure how many people here are actually musical fans. Uh, I did not think I would be when my wife Whitney and I bought season tickets for the Dallas Summer Musicals 20 years ago now. <laughs> she winced when I said 20 years ago. Uh, we renewed those tickets for, for a while until we uh, moved out to Henrietta for a few years. And over that time, we saw easily more than 50 shows at Fair Park over the years. Uh, at first, I was only going because I thought Whitney would like them, honestly. Um, I love my wife. I'm like, yeah, she'll, she'll love musicals. It'll be a guaranteed date. I certainly did not expect to become a fan of musical theater, but uh, then we started going, and as it turns out, I am, in fact, a fan of musical theater. Now, um, some more than others I like, of course, but in every one of them, the talent of the performers is incredible. I am not particularly musically inclined, so when I, when I see someone who can sing and dance and do the two at the same time and memorize lines, I'm very, very uh, impressed by that. And the creativity, like the, the ability to tell interesting stories and to explore complicated ideas. You know, some musicals are more complicated than others, but some of them get uh, quite deep That's um, in, an, in this very engaging way. That's really pretty inspiring. Sometimes it's incredibly inspiring, and the musicals that we're talking about in this series give us plenty to think about. Now, of the shows that Whitney and I saw over the years at the Dallas Summer Musicals, uh, some were truly exceptional shows that I can see again and again and again. I would put musicals like uh, Les Mis in that category and Rent and Wicked. Um, Hamilton, I saw relatively recently on stage. We watched it on July 4th. I love Hamilton. So there are those, those shows you can watch again and again. And then uh, some of the shows were, were good, um, but seeing them once was enough. <laughs> I would put shows like Phantom of the Opera and Miss Saigon in that category. I'm glad we saw them but there's no need for me to see them again. And then there was usually one show each season that was kind of a dud. Uh, for example, we were not particularly fond of Camelot. That was the only musical we ever walked out of. Apologies to anyone who loves Camelot. I heard from some people who love Camelot after the first couple of services. I did not love Camelot. And believe it or not, our musical for today, Jesus Christ Superstar, was one that I frankly did not like at all the first time that I saw it. Now, Jesus Christ Superstar made its, its Broadway debut in October 1971. That's the original uh, poster from Broadway. And it's obviously an iconic musical at this point. Uh, it was at Fair Park back in April on its 50th anniversary tour. This week, it's at Bass Performance Hall on its 50th anniversary tour. But back when I saw it for the first time, I was very underwhelmed. So it was our, our third year attending Dallas Summer Musicals, the third season, and that 2004 season included Big River, which is one of my favorites, um, Miss Saigon, which was great, Little Shop of Horrors, which was fun, loved all those musicals, and so our expectations had been set pretty high. I was particularly looking forward to Jesus Christ Superstar, probably for obvious reasons. Uh, I, I was a youth minister at the time. I actually considered taking the youth group to see it. I'm glad we did not do that in retrospect. Um, but I'm always looking for connections between theology and pop culture. Plus, it was written by Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice. That's one of the most accomplished songwriting duos in musical theater history, so I totally expected that I was going to love this musical, but then we went to see it, uh, and I was not a fan, not of the production, mind you. The performers were fantastic, as they always are, but because it was so different than I had expected. Now, just so I know, how many people here have seen some version of Jesus Christ Superstar? Okay, even if you have not, don't worry. I'll tell you what you need to know for the, ser for the sermon today. <clears throat> so, First of all, I did not realize that Jesus Christ Superstar focuses on an important but a very narrow part of Jesus' life. It's about his last week uh, leading up to the crucifixion. 
Holy Week is very important, obviously, but it's really only a small part of Jesus' ministry, and frankly, I'm not sure it provides the best material for musical theater. It's a separate subject. And then the show takes great liberties with the characters in the story, particularly three of the main characters, Jesus, Judas, and Mary Magdalene. So Jesus comes across as kind of a spaced out hippie. This is the original version. Um, Maybe it's not surprising that he comes across as a hippie. Weber was only 22 years old when he wrote this show back in 1970. That was the year I was born. Apparently hippies were a thing then. I've never personally pictured Jesus as a hippie, so I I found that a little off-putting. And then Judas, who is played in the original, these are the original cast members, Um, He's played by Ben Vereen in the original, if you know that name. Ben Vereen's brilliant. He was nominated for a Tony for this performance, but he comes across as way more sympathetic uh, than the Gospels portray him. In fact, I'm not sure you can find a less sympathetic character in the New Testament than Judas, of course, um, but that's not the way he comes across in the musical. And then Mary Magdalene, this is from the current tour, um, she is depicted as a a woman of ill repute, uh, which is not in any way biblical. (laughs) That is not the way Mary Magdalene is portrayed in the Gospels. Now, in Andrew Lloyd Webber's defense, it is unfortunately consistent with the reputation that the, the church manufactured for her centuries after the New Testament was written, but that's a story for a different sermon. Most of all, I did not love how the show ended. Uh, after more than two hours of countless biblical inaccuracies, and I was in seminary when we saw this, so I was kind of insufferable about counting the biblical inaccuracies, but whatever. <laughs> it, was, it was all fresh in my mind. Uh, and then, you know, that early 70s rock opera, which is not really my favorite musical genre, I, I leaned over to Whitney as we're nearing the end, and I said, hey, we're finally getting to the good part. And then the lights came on, and the show was over. Because if you've seen it, you know Jesus Christ Superstar ends with Jesus being laid in the tomb, which of course is the saddest and darkest part of Christian history and theology. And so when we did not get to see the resurrection after sitting through two hours of this musical, I got pretty grumpy. So I said, that's it? And I said it really loud, (laughs) probably louder than I should have as all the people around us stood. Who knows, maybe it was some cast member's mother sitting next to me. This... This, this ends before the resurrection. You've got to be kidding me. That's the whole point of the story. And I'm going on and on and on. And my wife, Whitney, who is the level-headed one in the relationship, said, shh. And she grabbed me by the arm and she pulled me to the exit. And out we went. I was griping the whole time. <laughs> that was my first impression of Jesus Christ Superstar. Now, I've seen it a couple times since. Uh, I've seen it in a couple different venues since, including the, the live TV performance with John Legend a few years ago on Easter, which was terrific. Uh, And now that I know what to expect, I can appreciate Jesus Christ Superstar for what it is. Um, It's not a Bible study, right? If I want theological accuracy, I can read the book. I've got lots of copies of it. Instead, it's what I think is really a very creative exploration of what is, to me, uh, the most important question that we disciples have to answer for ourselves on our journey of faith. And it's a It's a question raised by our reading for today. This is uh, one of my favorite little sections of my favorite book uh, of the Bible, or really of all time, John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 60 to 69. So listen, friends, for the word of God as it is proclaimed by God's servant, the evangelist John. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? I'll tell you in a minute what he was talking about. But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the 12, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? 
You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So in all four of the Gospels, there comes this moment of truth for the disciples. It's a moment uh, when Jesus confronts, I think that's the right word, confronts them directly uh, with what I think is the most important question that every disciple has to answer for themselves. You know, in the Gospels, there's plenty of, um, of noise around Jesus. There's plenty of talk and speculation about who the Jewish authorities think he is. Um, there's a fair amount of um, wrestling with who he himself claims to be and about who the crowd thinks he is. But Jesus is, is way more interested in what his followers think and believe. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, the moment of truth question that Jesus asks is, who do you say that I am? So you can just picture Jesus looking directly into your eyes and asking you, who do you say that I am? It doesn't matter what they think. Doesn't matter what the preacher says. Doesn't matter what the church says. What do you think? Who do you think that I am? Now here in John's gospel, this exchange is as much uh, a moment of crisis as it is a moment of truth. Jesus has just completed what scholars refer to as the bread of life discourse. It's where he uses language that, that we've come to associate with the sacrament of Holy Communion. And he has said something that must have sounded strange at best, downright crazy at worst, to his original audience. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. Now, we have the benefit of 2,000 years of Christian tradition, especially those of us who have been in the church for a while. We've heard the liturgy of Holy Communion a lot. We know that there is a spiritual presence of Jesus in the sacrament. We've got so much theology packed into Holy Communion that kind of comes right to mind for us. I think it's easy for us to take for granted um, that all that we understand and believe about Holy Communion. But of course, these words would have been confusing to those hearing them for the first time. It was so challenging, in fact, that John tells us that many of those who thought they wanted to follow Jesus uh, decided to go away. They, this they could not abide. And seeing that, that many people were leaving, Jesus asks the 12, do you also wish to go away? This is, this is John's version of who do you say I am. Today, we don't really struggle with Holy Communion. At least I don't, I don't think we do. We're, we're familiar enough with that theology. But there is plenty in Christ's teaching and example that challenges every one of us. And there, there comes a moment or many moments, moments of truth, moments of crisis sometimes in the life of discipleship when every single one of us has to decide if the teaching of Jesus is too difficult for us, if we're willing to follow him no matter what, if we have um, the courage and the commitment and the faith not only to, to believe what he says, that's one thing, but to do what he says. And that faith is only possible if we are clear about who he is to us. What I've come to appreciate about Jesus Christ Superstar is that it, it not only asks the most important question of discipleship, it also gives us the consequences of getting that answer wrong. Uh, the title actually comes from the misconception that, that people had about Jesus. As Andrew Lloyd Webber describes it, to the crowd, uh, Jesus was a superstar who could heal their every ill, cure their every disease, solve their every problem while to the Jewish authorities, Jesus was the superstar whose popularity threatened to weaken their hold on power. And Judas, for his part, fears that G Jesus' reputation is, is getting out of hand. This is the John Legend version. John Legend on the right plays Jesus, and that's uh, Judas who's got his hands on his neck. For Judas, the title superstar is a pejorative one. It sarcastically refers to the adoration of the crowds because to Judas, uh, Jesus is just a man. A man who's, who's getting caught up in his own hype, a man who will unwittingly bring about the destruction of both himself and his followers. All of which is to say, 
understanding Jesus as superstar is a, is a misconception of his ministry and his mission. And in the musical, it only leads to confusion and disappointment and pain for those who, who misunderstand him in this way. Of all the characters in the show, it's Mary Magdalene who, in my opinion, uh, has the, the purest and the most honest feelings about Jesus in perhaps the most famous song in the show. She acknowledges that her relationship with Jesus has changed her, uh, but she's not exactly sure what to do next. Now, Andrew Lloyd Webber uh, implies that she has some kind of romantic feelings for Jesus, which I think is actually an unfortunate distraction because both the the title and the lyrics of Mary Magdalene's signature number, I don't know how to love him, capture that kind of, of wrestling that I believe every disciple has to go through on their journey of faith, as does the song that Brian and McKenna are gonna sing in just a minute, Could We Start Again, Please? It's a, it's a duet between Mary Magdalene and Peter after Jesus' arrest. And the way it's normally staged, it's really a poignant number. Uh, in the foreground, in the spotlight, Jesus is um, being whipped by uh, the Roman centurion, uh, while Peter and Mary Magdalene are in the, in the background in a spotlight looking on and, and wrestling with what's going on. And it captures this, this wrestling that I believe uh, we all have to go through. It's, it's this question about the fundamental struggle of discipleship, um, the necessity of, of sacrifice in the context of faithful living. They're watching what's happening. They can't believe that it, this has to be part of it. We don't want to believe it sometimes, but, but sacrificial love is a central part of the story of our faith. It's a central part of who Jesus was, of course. And so, as it turns out, Jesus Christ Superstar this musical written by a very young composer who had no theological training uh, actually does a, a, a very creative job, in my opinion, of, of asking the fundamental question, who is Jesus to each of us? Is he, is he just an inspired teacher whose moral lessons guide our lives as his followers? I mean, that's an important part of his identity, but <laughs> that's only part. Or is he a miracle worker? Is he, is he the person we turn to in our, in our brokenness when we need something? It's an important part of who he is too, of course, but it's only a part. Is he, is he just a prophet speaking truth to power and siding with the oppressed and marginalized like all the prophets in our faith history? That's surely part of it, but only a part. When we call him our Lord and Savior, there, there are these loaded terms, laden with meaning. And we've got to wrestle with the question of what exactly uh, does that mean to us and for us as his followers? Well, thankfully, we have Peter to guide us. <laughs> Peter answers that question for all of us. The, the answer that each of us is called to discover for ourselves in our own spiritual journeys. He says to Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. And when he says that, he doesn't mean you have the words that get me to heaven. I mean, that's part of it. And not an unimportant part of it. But it actually means a changed life, a life of meaning and purpose. It means a life uh, with God both on this side of the grave and then forever after it's both and then Peter says we have come to believe and know that you are the holy one of God where else would we go now that we know this we have come to believe and know that you are the holy one of God and here there's just one detail in Greek I promise you it's not a boring one (laughs) there's a special verb tense in Greek called the past perfect And we don't have this in English, and so we miss something in the translation on this passage. The past perfect indicates an action completed in the past that has continuing effect in the present and beyond. So that when Jesus is telling, uh, when Peter is telling Jesus, when Peter is saying on our behalf that uh, Jesus is the one that we have come to believe in and know, that means that, that once we're clear about who he is, once we understand that he is, Yes, our teacher for sure and and our our miracle worker and a prophet for sure, but not just that. Once we 
understand that he is our Lord and Savior, what Peter calls the Holy One of God, once we answer for ourselves the most important question, this, this past action <laughs> with continuing effect, our faith in Jesus Christ will be for us the words of eternal life, a life with God both now and on the other side, a resurrection. Since its release a half century ago, Jesus Christ Superstar has been fairly controversial in some circles. I'm sure you know that. Maybe you grew up in some of those circles, mostly for the reasons that we've talked about today. But for me, anything that helps us to clarify our faith, anything that, that challenges us to think deeply and to ask the big questions, <laughs> well, it can't be all bad. And despite my issues with this iconic musical I think it certainly poses the most important question that we all have to answer as followers of Christ. Who is Jesus to you?